Hello, guys, and welcome to another edition of Conversation with a Socialist. I am talking with Richard Worth, who is uh, from, from the UK, uh, socialist. Uh, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Um, in, in the UK, yes. And uh, what is your position within the uh, association or local movement or whichever? Yeah, um, I, I'm the branch secretary of the Devon Socialist Party, it, which is Devon's in the southwest of England. Mm. And um, I'm also on the regional committee for the southwest, for the whole of the southwest region, which, by you know, it, it's one of the biggest areas in in the country in that sense. And uh, we're a rural community, but we're also got a lot of poor people working in tourism, and and because we tend to be the more scenic area of the country, um, and so yeah, we we cover quite an area really. Sounds about right. Uh, how many members? Although I've said that, by your standards, it would seem like a like a short distance. I'm sure. <laughs> I don't know about that, but anyway, um, how how many members would you say off the top of your head you have uh, in your chapter? Well, uh, the Socialist Party in uh, the UK is is a, a relatively small party. Throughout the the England and Wales section, we have about two thousand members. Okay. In, in Devon, where, where I am, which is only a very small branch compared to some of the bigger branches around the, the more uh, industrial areas of the country, um, we've got about 40 to 50 members. Mm. And so uh, what, what is going on there with the, uh, I would want to say NHL, but it's actually NHS. Um, now, what's going on there with the, with that program? Uh, uh, I, when I hear they're trying to privatize it, and uh, yeah, but yes. the corporations access to it. Yes, the NHS or our National Health Service, which is a public uh, owned uh, institution, which was founded back in 1948 after the Second World War, was the aim of it was to give free medical care to everybody. Uh, free at the point of use, and um, and it's transformed the lives of many working class people around the country because it gave the opportunity to see doctors without having to pay that they couldn't afford, and it's it's been the backbone really of workers in this country for decades, and a lot of people um, would not be here today without it, um, but it's. A national institution that has been under attack ever since it was formed. Um, it's been underfunded, it's been run down, and it's been attempted to be privatized, as you rightly say, with private companies coming in to make profits on the back of taxpayers' money um, on, the, on the basis that there's enormous profits to be made in healthcare in this country. And the NHS, the National Health Service in the UK, prevented all that profit being made by these companies because they couldn't compete with this wonderful institution that was so well run and economically tight and, and did such great service. But as I said, it's been run down and run down. And now the private healthcare industry in this country is booming. And uh, the NHS, the National Health Service, is almost becoming a, a second rate almost a two-tier system, used mainly for, you could argue for some people, for certainly for the richer and more middle-class elements in society, as a two-tier system for emergencies only. And of course, the COVID um, uh, crisis that we all now are living through has fallen firmly on the backs of all our National Health Service staff, our nurses, our doctors, our, our cleaners in the health service, et cetera, et cetera, porters, all the low paid staff that the NHS has, they face the burden of COVID and they have worked immensely hard, but the strain on our NHS services today is absolutely unbearable. And uh, you may or may not have heard, but um, as from today, we are going into a full lockdown in uh, England uh, joining Scotland as well. So most of Britain is now in a full lockdown again with all shops and services closed because our health service, our hospitals are, are struggling to cope. They are so full of the second um, 
wave of, of COVID cases that we are now struggling to survive. In fact, Britain holds the enviable position now of almost being the, the fastest rate of growth in COVID uh, in the world. And we are fast um, approaching, um, well, we are currently running at about 75,000 deaths approximately. Yeah, uh, what did um, what did Brexit do to uh, do the whole thing did that did that open uh, NH, uh, NHS uh, to uh, the open market or? Uh... Yes, uh, I, I mean, if you the history of the NHS was it, it got, I mean it, it was virtually a, a complete wall to the private sector. They couldn't break through. But what happened in 1997, um, we had the election of Tony Blair, who you may remember from the yeah. uh, times of Tony Blair, who was supposedly uh, a Labour politician, i.e. A, a, a so-called member of the Labour Party, which is supposed to represent the working class in this country, but doesn't. It's a boss's party. Yeah. And um, he was the first to break down the national service and open it up to private competition. And he did that by bringing in the private um, sector to build hospitals. They used a thing called the private finance initiative where private companies would build hospitals and we, the taxpayer, would carry on paying interest to these private companies for those use of those buildings. Um, and that was the crack in the wall of the NHS that led to the private companies breaking through. Mm. I mean, it started also prior to Tony Blair with M Margaret Thatcher, who privatized all the cleaning and portering all the low level jobs by letting contractors come in and do those jobs. But it ultimately was broke the wall of the NHS public uh, sector, um, hospital healthcare was broken by, by Tony Blair. And it's just gone on ever since. And today, under the conservative government that we have, the right wing conservative government, that the private sector is virtually running the, the, all, the, all, the, all the care in many respects. In fact, the NHS is now just a great big pot of money, which is taxpayers' money, which is given out to contract. And many of those contracts are given to private sector companies to provide. So we have all the, the services that are offered up for tender that go to the private sector. The NHS is still there. We still have a publicly funded free at the point of use healthcare. We still have a lot of good and the NHS is still in our hands. It is still our NHS and not their NHS, but it's, it's literally in a bad way. And uh, we need a socialist government to save it. Uh, what is the closest? Uh, well, first of all, may I ask uh, where did the uh, the N the NHS uh, model come from? Well, it was it was formed after uh, the history is is straightforward enough in the sense that after the Second World War, the damage to the nation was such that the bosses, the capitalist class in this country had to give workers something or face revolt because the devastation of the blitzes and all the deaths that had happened during the war meant that workers that were coming back from uni in uniform to, to bring, come back to a, a broken country, looked to the um, government to make it, you know, a, 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 if you like, a land fit for heroes, which was a phrase coined for the First World War, but also applied to the Second World War. And the, the, they recognised that there was a need to give reforms, give, give concessions to the working class to keep a revolt away from the door. And so that the healthcare system that had been actioned in 1948 um, was actually designed by all the parties during the war. In a thing called the Beveridge Report, which um, examined the needs of giving free health care to people. And it was a concession made to the workers of this country to give them that chance to get um, back on their feet and keep them happy. And of course, it followed the Second World War boom when, when we had a growth in the economy globally. And so the NHS initially was a great success. 
And uh, like I said, it gave people free health care for the first time. Um, and it was designed by, or it was set in place by a socialist called Anarin Bevan, who was a member of the uh, Labour Party uh, cabinet um, for, in, in charge of health um, under the prime minister, which was uh, Clement Attlee. And um, like I said, it was a great reform, but like all reforms, they're only temporary. When the economic situation will allow the capitalists, they targeted it for bring, clawing back those gains because capitalism still existed. It wasn't a socialist country, Britain. And so, although initially it was a, a concession to the workers of this country, over the last decades, it's been attacked, clawed back, and now the NHS is hanging by a thread. Yeah. Um, what, that, it sounds like that became, uh, that became in existence uh, the same way as the uh, uh, Social Security and Medicare, and Medicare came to existence here in the United States. Yeah, uh, very similar. Very similar, because at the same time in the UK, they also brought out, um, uh, like you say, welfare support. We had a social care uh, system put in place and, and basically a lot of reforms and housing. Uh, the the post-war Labour government in that sort of 1945 to 51 was responsible for building a lot of public housing for workers, what we call social housing or council houses. Uh, it was known as in the UK, which gave workers a decent home uh, with low rents. Um, that meant that working class families could could have decent standard of living. But once again, <laughs> that was a reform. It, it wasn't permanent. And over time, the, the, the Tories and the, the capitalists, the, the Tories being in, uh, the right wing conservatives in this country, have attacked it. And so um, we saw Margaret Thatcher in uh, 1979 um, bring out about a revolution in council housing by selling it all off. People were able to buy their houses and we very we, ha we have very little now uh, public social housing and we have a housing crisis in Britain as a result. Uh, I'm, I've been trying to follow Brexit and uh, not only through uh, uh, the CWI website but also through other socialist and Green Party uh, UK uh, websites as well, and um, I'm I'm looking at the, the the whole thing. You guys basically you guys basically had the same uh, basically the UK version of Donald Trump, as it looked like. Yes, I think mean, I think he's um, Mr. Boris Johnson. Yeah, he's very similar to Donald Trump, but on a much smaller scale. But he he shares cer certain um, traits that that your Mr. Trump uh, certainly had and has. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, now, what is the socialist uh, uh, opinion, do you know, of uh, Jeremy Corbyn? Well, Jeremy Corbyn was a breath of fresh air. The, the Labour Party, which in this country, in your country, you've got the Republican Party and the Democrats as the main two parties. In this country, we have the Conservative Party, also known as Tories. Um, and we have the Labour Party, and who are supposed to be the representatives of the working class of this country. Yeah, basically the, the uh, somewhat Democrats uh, right now of the yeah. the, uh, of the UK kind of life. That's right, but unfortunately, um, the Labour Party, which was formed um, back in 1911 by the Railway Workers Union, uh, it was formed by the trade unions of this country to give working people a voice in parliament, our, 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 our um, sort of um, ruling legislator. Um, but what has happened in that time is that the careerists, the people that uh, see politics as a career have entered into the Labour Party. They've forged themselves lucrative careers and the Labour Party has basically been um, an, a means of attacking the working class, but you're wearing a Labour Party badge, making it more acceptable to workers. And an example of that is Tony Blair, because Tony Blair was undoubtedly, as Margaret Thatcher, probably the biggest Tory that this country's seen uh, prior to Mr. Johnson. Um, Tony Blair was seen as, as Margaret Thatcher's greatest achievement 
bringing about something that was called new labor, a turn away from socialism from the Labour Party to be in a neoliberal reforming capitalist party, a big business party. And Jeremy Corbyn was a breath of fresh air because he was from the old tradition of the Labour Party. And so when he got elected um, as leader of the Labour Party, it was it was out of the blue, frankly. Um, he had to rely on people on the right wing of the Labour Party nominating him to get on the ballot paper, which if they hadn't done, he wouldn't even been on the ballot paper to get elected as leader. But they saw it as a way of being democratic, never expected him to win. But there was this great surge in interest and membership to the Labour Party as young people in particular joined up to be a member of the Labour Party to vote for Jeremy Corbyn because he promised so much. He offered all the things that we were looking for, nationalisation of the railways, uh, bringing the, the, the public transport system back into public ownership. He, he offered free uh, education for students, not having to pay massive fees to universities to go to college, etc. And all the things that, that we've been looking for for years was what Jeremy Corbyn initially represented. Unfortunately, though, he was very much... Um, on his own. He got elected by the mass membership of the Labour Party, but he was surrounded in a sea of pro-capitalist, anti-Corbyn um, right-wing politicians who from day one set about sabotaging his premiership. And uh, he had opportunities to take them on, to take a stand and fight for things, but all the time he conceded, he conceded and he conceded to the point that eventually they were able to remove him by use of um, the general election that took place in uh, 2019, which saw the election of uh, Boris Johnson, our small version of Don Donald Trump, um, and that ended Jeremy Corbyn's time. And since then, we've got a new leader of the Labour Party, who's a knight of the realm. He's called Sir Keir Star Starmer. And um, he's a Tory boy in the Labour Party running it. And uh, he's very happy to go along with the same sort of neoliberal um, ideas that Tony Blair had. And uh, so the Labour Party is now nothing is firmly back in the, in the hands of the uh, being a safe second party for the Tories, uh, for the capitalists of this country, should the Tories lose an election, which they are likely to do, given the incompetence of this government so far, as demonstrated in the COVID crisis. Yeah, uh, now I, I with past uh, episodes, have uh, compared um, German Corbyn with our, with our Bernie Sanders here. Yes, I think that's a fair comparison. Uh, but the, only, the only difference is, um, I think, uh, and Corbyn knew that he was uh, uh, amongst wolves, if you will, whereas in, uh, and didn't really try to uh, run out and try to reform the Labour Party as far as the, the right wing version of it, or wing of it, if you will. But with, with uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, he knew that he knew. I think from uh, the very beginning that it was a corporation, but he still ran as a Democrat instead of running as independent. Uh, when I think he, he could have won as independent, I don't think uh, Corbyn, Corbyn was never an independent in regards to um, uh, holding office. I mean, he, was, he, he was always Labour. Yeah, I think that's that's a fairly accurate idea. I mean, both of them may have been well intentioned. And I have no doubt people will tell you that they believe the sincerity and honesty of Jeremy Corbyn. And I'm sure a lot of people will say the same about Bernie Sanders. But the reality is they both have made big mistakes. Um, and we were the biggest supporters of Jeremy Corbyn in this country because we saw a chance to turn the Labour Party back into what it should be. And that is a mass party of the working class to fight for reforms and socialism in this country. But sadly, that needed to be done by tackling the right wing elements in the party and uh, reclaiming the Labour Party for the workers of this country. That never took place with Jeremy Corbyn. He always decided to concede to the right. He saw his role as being a broad church where all views could be held. 
but the reality is you're in a struggle and they were out to crucify him and um but if he'd have shown an ounce of the uh, um, opposition that they showed to him, then he would have succeeded better. But since he's been replaced, the right wing of the Labour Party in this country have acted with, with Keir Starmer to attack socialists within the Labour Party and expel them, to suspend them, kick them out. So far, there's been over... 60,000 people have left the Labour Party since um, the election of the new leader and Jeremy Corbyn is no longer actually a Labour MP. He sits as an independent in the Houses of Parliament in this country oh. because he's, now, he's been suspended from the Labour Party. He's what? a member, of, he's been suspended, he's been allowed back into the Labour Party, but he's not allowed to join the Labour group in Parliament. So he sits on the benches on his own as an independent. So he's so now he's forced to be something he should have been in the first place. Yeah, yeah. Well, he certainly should have made a stance while he was leader of the Labour Party. He could have. I've always put the point of view that obviously by standing up and opposing the right wing of this uh, of his own party would have led to massive splits. The media would have um, throttled him. But at the end of the day, I would rather have had thirty to forty decent socialists. Labour MPs in Parliament representing the working class than to have 200 pro-capitalist, pro-big business MPs and uh, uh, in control. And that's exactly what we've got and had under Jeremy Corbyn because he never took them on. Never actually, we, we called for accountability of our representatives so that the right to recall, if you like, so that an MP, a member of parliament in, in, in this country, a, a senator, I guess, in your country, um, if they're not representing the views of the membership of the party, they should be held to account and, up, and held to re-election. And they should, should be replaced if they're not doing the job that they were elected to do and fight for the workers of this country. And that's what we call reselection: the chance for the membership to reselect their representatives. But Jeremy Corbyn had the chance to bring that in, but never did. And, and now, as a result, he sits on the benches of Parliament um, on his own. I wonder if he looked at the general election where he, I guess, Labour got their butts handed to him um, as a way out, as far as, as far as being the head of Labour, since he knew that he wouldn't be able to get a lot of the uh, right-wing uh, Labour Party members uh, on his side and vote for the one what for the policy that he would be uh, in charge of? No, I, I don't think, like I said, you, you could never doubt Jeremy Corbyn's sincerity and honesty. It's just he wasn't, he wasn't, he's not, he wasn't a, a proper Marxist in the sense that he, he had no strategy about how he was going to bring about the changes that he wanted. And um, he worked with people that were just out to get him. And, uh, and it just wasn't him. I mean, currently in Parliament today, we have about 30 so-called socialist Labour MPs out of a party of, uh, of over 200 Labour MPs. That's, a, that's the size of the so-called socialist group within the uh, Labour Party in Parliament. But they've just gone quiet. They do nothing. They say nothing. They do nothing. And, and it's kind of where we are. They tend to go with the flow rather than make a stand and and what we need in this country and in your country too is a new workers party and if we take bernie sanders as an example as you rightly said had he stood as an independent even back in the first election in 2016 against donald trump when the democrats maneuvered to make sure he wasn't the democratic candidate he should have stood as an independent and he could, even if he hadn't won, which he would have had a chance of stopping Trump, he would have built a new party around him at that point, which would have then won in, in the recent election, that's in the election of Joe Biden, who is nothing more than a watered down version of Trump. Um, a reliable pair of hands for the capitalist class, just as in this country, we've got Keir Starmer, who are, who's a reliable pair of hands for, for the capitalist class in Britain. So basically, the basic stormer is like Joe Biden in the UK in regards to that. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. 
I said nowhere stormer as the Joe Biden. Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. He's probably not got as much blood on his hands, but he's he's certainly in that yeah, sort of frame. Was in that closet, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, uh, uh, so the Labour Party, as far as the Socialist Party in this country is concerned, is is dead. I mean, that's the reality. Um, and it's up to the trade unions in this country to recognise that now and to help us form a new workers' party so that working class representation can mean something um, rather than supporting the same watered-down conservative policies that you will get uh, and it's a tweedledee tweedledum thing you won't be able to tell them apart they may do it differently they may do it with a smile on their face but the outcome will be the same they yeah. will still attack the working class yeah uh, now is it true that that uh that i think 60 uh mps of labor uh didn't uh did they voted against uh the brexit um announcement a couple of days ago yeah, I, I mean, there has been opposition to, to Brexit. Um, I mean, the Brexit issue is another case in point um, of the failure of Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn, throughout his life on the back benches as a, just a simple representative uh, for, um, as an MP, a member of parliament, um, had opposed the Brexit, uh, sorry, had opposed the European Union because the European Union is nothing more than a neoliberal um, bosses club who has attacked workers all across Europe. Greece, Spain, Portugal have all felt the boot of the demands of the European Union on f fiscal responsibility and, and cuts to jobs and standards of living for workers right across Europe have all been affected by the European Union and, and the, um, uh, the, the, the European Central Bank's demand for austerity and um, what Jeremy Corbyn has always done is oppose the European Union. But when it came to appeasing the right wing of his own party, he ditched his views and allowed the party to have a very middle of the road stance, which did not appeal to the workers of this country who wanted to leave the European Union, nor to the people that wanted to stay in the Euro European Union. Sitting on the fence did nothing. Um, and so Brexit was part of the reason why the general election of um, 2019 saw Jeremy Corbyn lose, because Boris Johnson had a very simple uh, slogan, which was um, get Brexit done, which appealed to a lot of working class people, particularly in the north of England. Um, and Jeremy Corbyn's message and the message of the Labour Party was so complicated that even I didn't understand it at times. Um, Corbyn, didn't, Corbyn didn't have a plan from what, from what I can tell. Dude. And they flipped and flopped and, all went, and you know, it was unclear and, and it never addressed the reasons for Brexit. The reasons for Brexit was a lot of workers in this country fed up with years of austerity inflicted on them by governments that said, and, and basically a feeling that um, they wanted to scream and shout back. They wanted to inflict, be heard, if you like. Yeah. Um, and it was a it was a protest vote. There was elements of racism in it. There was undoubtedly nationalism, which was what the right wing and the right wing parties, um, particularly Nigel Farage, that you probably are aware of as well. Um, oh yeah. I, yes, yes. Another friend of Trump. Um, um, I mean, they 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 carried out the British can be powerful again, waving the British flag, this nationalistic idea that Britain could be great again. Uh, utter nonsense, of course, from oh a, a second-rate economy that's quickly going down the toilet, frankly. Um, they took a page out of a uh, Trump book on that one. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're very similar in that sense. Um, but at the same time, of course, um, what Jeremy Corbyn failed to do was call for a workers' Brexit where we would reach across to the countries and the workers of other countries to form international solidarity based on socialism and fight for workers' rights and fight for the, the gains that, that uh, a freedom from the neoliberal austerity-driven EU has been for workers to have the say and forge workers' alliances across 
the water to countries uh, in the European Union to fight back. And the European Union is in a state um, because obviously they've lost Brexit, they've lost Britain rather, um, and there are now rumblings in Italy. They, there's a possibility that it, it may take time, but Italy certainly uh, have a, a big opposition now to the European Union. And there are, there are still rumblings in Spain and there's rumblings in Portugal. Um, and so the European Union project is certainly under threat. And if after the COVID crisis that capitalism has failed to deal with, after the, the economic crisis that now looms, the attempt by the bosses to the capitalists to attack workers with more austerity, to claw back the money that they're having to spend at the current time, will undoubtedly lead to further revolt and protest. And that could well mean that certain countries, particularly poorer countries like Italy, one of the founding members of the European Union, could even end up leaving the European Union itself. And that could be the end of the European Union. I mean, all, all these things will be tested by time and we'll see what happens. But certainly Jeremy Corbyn could have captured the working class um, opposition to the European Union with a socialist message rather than leaving them at prey to the right wing, neoliberal, austerity, patriotic, flag waving idiots like Farage and, and help workers see that a better way would be a socialist solution as opposed to um, a, a a nationalistic Brexit, which is what we're currently going down the pan with. Right. Uh, what? What? Uh, where? Where does uh, does uh, Corbyn uh, represent? What does he represent? Yeah. Well, he would call himself a socialist, and therefore he has been a socialist voice and then like i said initially he was a force for good and he still is to some extent he even even today just like bernie sanders if he was to call for a formation of a new workers party left the labor party himself completely and said i'm going to start up a new workers party because of the fame if you like and the influence that he has following his leadership of the labor party he could form a new party overnight there could be thousands, up to 500,000 people that could be immediately recruited to a new workers' party in this country if Jeremy Corbyn made that call. Sadly, he's never going to do that, and he's not going to do it. Yeah, and uh, he, he, he's elderly. He, wants, uh, he, he, he hasn't got that socialist perspective, that fighting Marxist understanding of the need for a new workers' party. He still believes in the Labour Party, just like Tony, Tony Benn did. And the reality is that we need a new workers' party, just as in America, you need a new workers' party because the Democrats are a boss's party. The Labour Party here is a boss's party. We are both in the same situation, as indeed many countries in Europe are. But that, uh, unlike Britain and America, certain countries in Europe have already moved to form new left formations. Not that um, uh, you would think so by some of their policies, but there is a move away from the traditional social democratic type parties that have consistently failed workers across the world, let alone in Europe and uh, America. Well, the biggest problem, well, first of all, let me clarify something. I was asking, uh, German Corbyn is an MP, right? Yes, he's a, still a member of parliament, yes. I was asking what part of the UK is he? Uh, rep is he oh, right. Yes, he, he's in Islington, which is a part of London. So he still represents the people of Islington, which is a, a, a bearer of London. Um, what, and uh, what is the medium income there? What, for as an MP or for all the people as a whole? People as a whole. Right. Well, that that's that's a difficult question to answer, really, because... Uh, this the, the, the difference between incomes now has never been so great. Um, the rich get paid so much more than workers. There's so much what we call precarious working going on with people working on zero hour contracts that they only get paid when they do an hour's work or, or, or very much subject to being available all the time, waiting for a message to get some, some money by doing some hours of work. Um, jobs are very insecure jobs are very poor but of course in london where 
it's a much more expensive place to live. Wages in general in, in the centre and the capital of Britain tend to be higher than the, the, the rural and, and uh, other air provinces of the UK. But an average uh, industrial wage, well, industrial, that might be exaggerating. We, we don't have that many industries now. We tend to be a more service-driven economy. Yeah, yeah. But an average income in this country could be anything from 20 to 30,000 pounds a year, which I'm not sure what that is in dollars. Um, uh, let's see. I've recently read that, uh, like, say, uh, like mortgage or something like that for, uh, for say, like a college or something like that back in uh, uh, England. Uh, it can be like 2,042, that's like 2,000 pounds there. You know, that, yes, that, 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 a month, that's right. I mean, many workers are now to pay for uh, or rent or mortgage takes up virtually most of their income. Certainly half their wages goes just to pay to live in a, uh, a residence. I mean, I, we, we did, well, before COVID anyway, um, yeah. we, we did street stores and we used to meet the public and sell our paper, the socialist uh, paper. Yeah, um, I, and, I, I saw a picture of that on your, uh, on your profile. On the yes. Yeah, we, 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 we do a lot of that. We, every week we'd be out on the streets talking to people, getting the, the mood of the working class, keeping in touch and understanding the issues that they face and uh, obviously recruiting to the Socialist Party. Um, but I always remember this um, young couple came up to me uh, in Bristol, which is a, it's a sort of like a, a, the 10th biggest city um, in Britain. Um, and um, they came up to me and they said, you know, that they'd like to buy a house because, you know, they, they, the young couple. But they said, by the time we paid our rent, we've got nothing left to save for buying a house. Yeah. And they, they were literally, they reckon that um, nearly 60%, more than half their earnings were going on just paying rent. Yeah. Um, and left, left, left them with 40% on all the other things like food, electricity, gas, etc. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they had no money. And um, the rents in this country are very much in the private sector. Private landlords have been ripping off a lot of people for years in this country. Um, and uh, the housing crisis is immense now. Yeah. We have thousands of homeless people, which I'm sure you're aware of in the United States, you have the well, same I, issue. I, I, and I, I, um, I want, there's a lot of poverty. We have uh, the probably in comparison to you probably the most per capita in regards to that, but I could be wrong about that. No, you're, you're probably right. I mean, America has been known for, for that um, yeah, I, inequality. I, I myself have been homeless before, but uh, uh, my next question is, um, uh, are you guys on a fiat currency system? On a what currency? Fiat. A fiat currency like uh, like America and USD is you guys have a central bank that uh, print that that can print down money based on uh, like bonds and all that stuff. Yes, indeed, indeed, and um, absolutely, the Bank of England it, it has done a lot of that, and a lot of support has been given to the um, bosses and the and the capitalists to maintain their business. They've certainly printed money. Um, uh, it was quite interesting because. Before the COVID crisis came about, we were told that nothing was affordable. There was no money to, available to spend on the health care of this country. The National Health Service was, you know, there was no money to, to, to increase the care that, and the provision of health care. There was no money to give further extra benefits to poverty and, and low paid workers. There was no money to build hospitals, no money to do anything. COVID strikes and all of a sudden money, magic money trees have sprouted up everywhere. Yeah. And um, the, the amount of money borrowing as well that, that's going on uh, to, to fund the spending of the capitalists um, is immense. And the, num the amount of debt that is now held by both businesses, but also privately, individual debt in this country is enormous. People are way down in, uh, in debt. And if interest rates were to rise, not likely in the current climate, but if they were to rise, it would cause real issues where people would be unable to pay the interest that would be due on their debts that many people have. 
uh, does UK control a lot of the finances that happen within the EU? Yes. I mean, one of the things that Britain stood out from the European Union, they never went into the Eurozone. So they, we, we, we kept the British pound. We did not sign up to a lot of the uh, economic things. And yes, the Bank of England still has a lot of power. And of course, now we've got Brexit. Um, financially, we are completely independent there from the European Union. We will no longer um, be able to have some of the grants that were given by the European Union, but likewise, we won't have to pay the membership fees that we had to pay. Um, but long term, Brexit is no solution to the crisis and the problems of British capitalism. The crisis that we now face with not just with the devastation and joblessness caused by the COVID crisis, we were already going into recession before COVID struck, struck, struck just as the US was. And the reality is that COVID has exasperated the problems that was inevitably uh, coming about with another recession. And now the situation is dire. So we have coming up a, term, a very difficult period. A lot of misery will be faced by a lot of people in this country. But at the same time, there'll be a lot of turmoil. There'll be protests, there'll be an opportunity, if you like, to fight back. Yeah. And it's up to us to, to be the voice to make sure that um, we take the fight on and uh, fight back against the capitalist class of this country that will make us pay for their systems failing failings um, under the COVID uh, crisis. Would you be willing to be one of my, my, uh, my informant, if you will, of UK during the Brexit transition and, and uh, uh, every once in a while, uh, uh, we'll have an interview where you can update me on uh, on transitions and how the general public are handling the Brexit and all that stuff. Well, on the Brexit transition, yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, yes, I mean, I mean, it's it's. It, 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 I mean, at the present time, the Brexit transition is that they've now signed a deal with the European Union, which is a free trade deal. Um, it has saved uh, the initial um, downturn that was going to happen where we with a lot of companies, a lot of bosses, uh, the private, um, uh, with the wealthy were panicked that we were going to leave the European Union without a deal. We, we saw the stock markets reduce quite drastically in the fear of a, a, a no deal scenario. But Mr. Johnson has now signed a deal with the European Union, which effectively keeps tariffs on goods away for the time being, which means that we will be able to freely trade with the European Union, which for a lot of British capitalists will be immensely important um, to keep the profits flowing. But at the same time, there's now a lot of bureaucracy required in the export of goods. There's a lot of extra forms and bureaucracy in involved. And uh, there is no doubt about it that firms are leaving the country um, uh, particularly in finance, the UK, London has been the centre of finance for the world for, for decades, but now that is no longer likely to remain the case. And uh, that the, the, a lot of finance centres will grow, like probably Frankfurt and Germany and uh, France as well, will buy to become the new centre of European finance. And Britain's role in that will decline. Uh, does uh, at, after this will uh, will UK be open to uh, for uh, internal uh, investments in regards to like uh, small businesses being able to uh, be brought back up once uh, COVID nineteen subsides, or at at the very least uh, home based businesses uh, being uh, propped up or more coming up as a result. Well. Obviously, we've just had a, a, a lockdown announced yesterday and the financial support from the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who's you know, in charge of the money, if you like, um, is that he's beginning, he's going to work out a plan where further support will be given to all firms, including small businesses. The reality is it's a drop in the ocean and um, the crisis that will be faced because of the... the the, the, the crisis at the present time is simple. 
it doesn't take Einstein to work this one out. <laughs> Workers are being paid less. They're being furloughed, so they're being not able to work. A lot of workers are, are now put on leave, if you like. They are still being paid, but at a lower rate than they were being paid. But their rents will stay the same. Their mortgages will stay the same. The cost of their food will stay the same. Everything else stays the same, but they're being paid less. And as you know, you can only spend what you've got. And so if you've got no money in your pocket because you're being paid less, you will not have the money to go out and spend, wherever that would be with big companies or small companies. So the crisis of British capitalism is going to be immense because workers will not have the money in their pockets to spend and businesses will go to the wall. We have seen a massive downturn in drop jobs already. Before Christmas, a million workers have already seen their jobs disappear, and particularly in retail, where shops have failed to be able to uh, sell goods because of A, people were uncertain about what was coming and also unable to shop because of lockdown. And a lot of smaller businesses have struggled to survive, particularly in hospitality and in retail. And after we get through the COVID thing, assuming that that happens this year with the vaccinations, then it, a lot of those will be lost for good. And a, certainly a lot of retail workers will find that their jobs have gone for good. Uh, you may want to bring the camera down a little more. And, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, that I, the, last, the last couple of times, well, you can't see me, uh, but uh, the last few minutes, you've been like, just nose up, no mouth. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, not, I'm having to hold me head near to the microphone so I can hear you. <laughs> I thought I'd let you know. Uh, no, uh, yeah, I, I remember when Donald Trump first got elected in, in 2016. Uh, he was asked about Brexit. He thought that was a, he was a great idea. Uh, I wonder if that means that he's uh, probably investing in a lot of uh, foreign companies that are based in UK and have now left UK. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Uh, the, the American, the idea was um, sold to the British public was that once we're out of the European Union, we can have this great trade deal with the United States of America. Um, and Donald Trump was obviously seeing an opportunity to bring further American firms into our markets. And to a large extent, that's not going to really um, help the workers of this country because, yeah. you know, that, that, that is, as you know, uh, no American president, whether it be Trump or Biden, is going to sign a deal that doesn't do anything other than good for, for uh, American capitalists. So the idea that that's going to be good for British workers is, 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 is never, is never going to materialize. Yeah. So the reality is, it's a, and of course, the, you know, the, the American markets are a lot stronger than, than the British markets. So, so there is bound to be a flow of goods from America to Britain rather than Britain to America. I mean, this idea of America first, they're not likely to welcome British products in, in, in the same way as perhaps they used to. And, it, and in some respects, the reason why Trump supported Brexit was because it was the same sort of message. You know, you were saying uh, with Donald Trump, you know, America first, and to some extent, Farage, and Boris Johnson in this country were saying Britain first. The reality is though, that our British economy is so weak that it cannot really compete on the world stage. And the idea that somehow that there will be this great revival of British capitalism under the new Brexit arrangements is just a joke and it won't happen. And we are facing further crisis. And that is the crisis of capitalism because that's the difference between the second world war ending and the situation after COVID. After the Second World War, there was a boom. And so things picked up. But the idea that after COVID that there is going to be a boom is, a, is just not true. Um, there will be re, a, a depression. There will be recession. There will be real stress and strain and misery for thousands and thousands of people, both in this country and your country. And that's why we need to fight to build a workers' party and, and forge uh, a new chance to uh, fight back and, and kick the capitalist class out of business and put workers in control. Right, exactly right. Uh, what is your opinion on the Green Party there? The, well, we, uh, we, well, we have um, 
sister organization in your country called the Independent Socialist Group. And I know yeah, in, that, in that. you do you know them, do you? Independent Socialist Group. Uh, yeah, the Independent Socialist Group. So we got we we are part in our organization, Socialist Party uh, in England and Wales, is part of the Committee for Workers International, which is a organization, a uh, federation, if you like, of yes, different. I, I, I think that Howie Hawk is a member of that. Yeah. Well, as a socialist part, we are the English and Welsh section of the Committee for Workers International. And we have fellow comrades in other countries like Austria, Algeria, Chile, um, Finland, France, Germany, India, Sri Lanka, um, Ireland, um, Japan, Malaysia, Nigeria, Scotland, uh, South Africa, and the United States, and our section in the United States is the Independent Socialist Group. Um, I will have to look that up because uh, I, I've never heard, until you said that, I, I had never heard of them. Yeah, yeah. Once again, a small group, but but they're they're growing well. I'll send you their email address and their link to them uh, on, on yeah, Facebook. That, that sounds good. That, that would, that I will I will be able to add that to my uh, first yes, email, yes, uh, yes. So. So as I said, so we are part of this international um, movement for, for workers' solidarity and fight, fighting for the same sort of ideas. Um, I've forgotten what we were talking about. <laughs> what was your initial question? Well, I, I was asking, uh, what is your opinion of the UK Green Party? Oh, that's right. So in America, um, our section, our independent socialist group, supported the nomination of... Um, was it Harry Hawkins? I can't remember. Yeah, in the yeah, no, Harry Hawkins and Joe Walker, yes. Yeah, so they supported his uh, presidency in America because I believe the Green Party in America is a, is a much more sort of left-leaning organization. In this country, in, in Britain, the Green Party is a bit of a broad church. They have some very good people in there and they, they're, once again, very sincere. Their, their fight against environmental damage is legendary. And they are, have become a very radical party compared to the right wing nature of all the other parties. However, they are still a fundamentally a pro business party. Um, they're not a socialist party. Um, and they were very much in favor of staying in the European Union, which, you know, is a valid argument you can, you can make, but fail to see the uh, economic restraints and the, the, the hold that the European, European Union has, has against socialism. Um, for example, you're not allowed to give state aid, you're not allowed to nationalize industries, uh, you're not allowed to have workers control and management of, of, of businesses um, because it's a neoliberal project. Um, so our attitude towards the Green Party in this country is that we see them as fellow travelers in, in many regards but they're not as clear on program as is required to bring about social transformation, to bring about an environmental um, uh, saving of the planet, because it's only through socialism that that is possible. Capitalism is never going to save um, uh, the environment because it's, it's just their pursuit of profit is all they care about. And so it's only under a, a, a global federal uh, socialist world that we could see uh, us, us actually fight the, the climate threat that is now facing us. Uh, are you guys associated with the uh, uh, the um, socialist uh, and social alternative? Yes, I am aware of them. You're aware of them, but I was asking, are you guys uh, associated with them at all? Um, we we used to be, we used to be, but. Um, that we have had uh, disagreements with them uh, over program. Um, and so we have a, a clearer Marxist Trotskyist position um, of the transitional program, talking about the need for working class trade unions. Because uh, in America, obviously, your trade unions are very much um, corporate bodies that do not represent the workers very much top-down organizations, but they need to be reclaimed in America just as they do in this country so that they represent the working class. 
and there was a move within socialist alternative to uh, move away from the need for working class unity in trade unions. You, can, you have to recognize the working class as the prime changer of society. Mm. Uh, wh what about the uh, SEP, uh, the Social Equality Party? The, the SWP, did you say? No, no, I said the SEP. The oh, the SEP. Yeah. Um, like I said, I'm a provincial, I'm not one of the high members of our party. I can't say I'm aware of them even. <laughs> the Social Equality Party, they're a, a trustee uh, of the, uh, members of the Fourth International. All oh, right, okay. No, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I didn't know that. No, no, it's okay. No, uh, yeah, I, and until I uh, interviewed uh, their uh, national secretary, uh, Joseph Shore, uh, who who had run for uh, for president in twenty twenty, uh, I I wasn't really aware of them myself. No, so I, like, okay, I mean, cool. as, as we know, on the left there are lots of different groupings, um, yeah. and there are people in my my party that would know them all, but yeah. I'm not one of them. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, I got I got to know the SCP a little bit because I, I've started to uh, read out their website, WSWS, uh, and also other socialist related and any communist uh, uh, related uh, uh, websites now. So that's what I was asking. Right. Uh, but we only have like maybe a minute or so. Uh, are there anything? Is there anything coming up that you, that you're aware of uh, within your party? Anything coming up in our party? Yes. Yeah, um, obviously, it is difficult to campaign at the present time during the lockdowns of um, coronavirus, etc. But we've done very well in the, the last year, 2020, despite the conditions faced, the difficulties faced by our party. We have seen our membership grow significantly. We've recruited from the Labour Party. A lot of Labour Party genuine socialists have come across and recognised the need for a revolutionary party like our own. And we are holding big events this year, and we are part of the trade union and socialist coalition, which is known as TUSC, T-U-S-C, right. Trade yeah. Union and Socialist Coalition, yeah. and, which I'm... is a formation to put up an electoral opposition to the bosses parties of the Labour Party and the, and the Tory Party, Conservative Party, and we have local elections, provincial event elections, if you like, we, we call them council elections, yeah. coming up in May, uh -huh. and the Trade Union and Socialist Coalition, which is backed by the Railway Union, the, the Railway and Maritime Transport Union, mm -hmm. and ourselves and various other groups, including some ex-Labour MPs like Chris Williamson, who, who used to be a Labour MP, and um, we will be standing candidates in those elections to oppose austerity and cuts and demand that we save the NHS and fight for our health service. And uh, we were doing that right across the country against labor politicians that carry out cuts and austerity. Uh, that's good to hear. Um, well, if you don't mind, I'll consider you kind of like my insider to the CWI. And uh, every once in a while, I'll, uh, I'll ask you for any updates that other than when I read out the website. Yes, by all means. Uh, I'd like to uh, also uh, sort of find someone in UK that'd be willing to be a part of the uh, uh, the GSB, which I, I don't know if you know uh, what, what it means, but it's Green Party and Socialist uh, News Channel. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to expand overseas since I, yes. uh, part of the news I read is overseas. So, uh, let me know if you know if you uh, know someone uh, there that'd be willing to. Uh, do some of that nature and send it to me, then I, I would put on I would put on my uh, my uh, YouTube channel. Yes, I've also promoted your channel um, across our party today, and um, I've also sent um, links to the American comrades, um, the socialist independent or the independent socialist group, and so hopefully you'll get some more followers in this country as a result of that. And I shall try and encourage my local um, members to take an active uh, listening road to, to your um, uh, podcast, which I've been listening to. And I've also listened to you on, on YouTube as well. Well, I appreciate the, the support and I appreciate you uh, promoting the crap out, out, out of my YouTube channel and my, uh, my anchor. Uh, my anchor is actually going to be going into a, a new uh, direction. It's going to be, uh, I'm going to be starting to uh, 
read books on there based uh, off of a uh, Green Party and socialist uh, books around around the world. Uh, one wants to be able to get more as far as that part goes. Uh, I, I do I do a lot with when it comes to this channel, and uh, there's another portion of Anchor I could do this on also. So. Uh, but I, I appreciate you being on. Uh, I look forward to talking to you again. Yes. Uh, we're actually past time now, which is, which, uh, is good for me. I have good for both of us in regards to people uh, listening and watching you. Um, and um, I look forward to uh, talking with you and other members of CWI. Yes, that sounds very good. Thank you very much. It's been a joy talking to you. And I hope Thank you keep safe much. and well. You, you as well. Good. <laughs> Goodbye, then, or good night. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>